Loving Father, once again, uh, it's a privilege, Lord, to uh, come into your presence and uh, together as a uh, remote group on this uh, platform, we thank you that we can continue to study your word. Uh, and even as we were just, just discussing, there is so much of upheaval in the world. We just remember so many who are suffering the recent uh, shootings in uh, in Texas and uh, the uh, the killings that's happening in Africa and Ukraine, Lord, there is so much of suffering. We indeed remember and pray for your kingdom. And as we study the scriptures, that it will only help us to become even more fervent in your way in, and in the faith that you've called us so that, Lord, we may, uh, if it is possible, bring good news to this world. And so, Lord, at this moment, we just want to commit the study into your hands and pray that your inspiration be with Praveen in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for uh, leading us in prayer. Uh, we are studying Book of Ephesians, and uh, since a few weeks, we are looking at uh, Chapter 1, and this would be uh, the closing of Chapter 1. And uh, once again, if you look at the outline of uh, Chapter 1, first half of the Chapter 1 of a Book of Ephesians can be considered uh, as... Um, Creation of the body of Christ. Of course, previously I have given one outline. This is, a, this is another way we can look at uh, the chapter 1 of the okay, book of Ephesians. Chapter 1 verse 1 to 14 can be considered as a creation of the body of Christ because Apostle Paul speaks about how the body of Christ was formed and, uh, and there are where some important uh, points and themes he gives. Number one is church was uh, established because uh, uh, we are chosen before the foundation of the world and uh, church has been established because God has blessed us with every spiritual blessings through which church is also continuing. And uh, the church, each and every believer in the church has been predestined to for the adoption as sons of God. So on this, uh, this is also one of the main, main uh, reasons the church has been established. And the church has been established by the redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. And it has been secured, completely established and secured by the Holy Spirit. So the first one to 14 verses, they do speak about the establishment of the church with various uh, uh, various uh, themes uh, we can read uh, in this chapter. And uh, this is all completely the work of God out of his sheer grace. And if you read the second half of uh, uh, this chapter, especially from verse 15 to 23, we can consider it as a uh, uh, like, you know, consecration of the body of Christ. First is the creation of the body of Christ. Second part is the consecration of the body of Christ. Just for the sake of rhyming, I use the word consecration. We can also consider it as a blessing of the body of Christ. Here, some main points we can see are, uh, uh, especially with the uh, Apostle Paul offers one interesting and amazing prayer. Uh, through the prayer, he prays for the uh, enlightenment um, of all the believers about the riches that they have in Christ Jesus and uh, he he uh, 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 can, uh, confirms again that we Christians are obtaining an inheritance in Jesus Christ and uh, he prays for uh, uh, empowerment uh, of every believer by the power of uh, the Spirit of God and uh, he also reminds us about our identity and uh, and he tells us that we are being seated in the heavenly places and we are subjected to Christ as head. So uh, as a part of consecration or blessing, God is enlightening us about the riches and he, uh, and he granted us an inheritance uh, in Christ Jesus. And he is also strengthening us by his spirit and by his power. And uh, he made us uh see he made us seat i mean to be seated in the heavenly places and uh, he made us body of christ and we are subjected to our head who is jesus christ so this part because of these points it sounds and looks more like consecration of the church 
So what we are going to do today is we will be focusing and discussing about the prayer, especially from verse 15 to 23, which are explaining about the consecration of the church. First of all, I would like to read that uh, verses and then we'll go into discussion about them. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 15 to 23. Therefore, I also, after I heard your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places? Far above in all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is an amazing prayer Apostle Paul prays for, for uh, uh, believers at Ephesus and ultimately it is for us also. We can find this kind of uh, some of these kind of prayers in uh, Ephesians, Colossians and Philippians and uh, th this is so interesting to read. Uh, and these Paul's prayers, especially the content he uh, provide uh, is so very deep and they explain about the Christian living, uh, how Christian life will be. And this content, uh, this not only gives us information about uh, uh, the Christian living, but it also establishes the vision for the church. What is church is looking forward. It gives us the vision for the church and it gives the identity for the church and its faith life for which church is called forth. So this prayer, they explain about the vision of the church, identity of the church, and explains how the faith life would look and what we are called for. If we look at uh, verses 15 to 16, uh, here Apostle Paul takes our attention towards uh, uh, some great qualities of uh, church at Ephesus. And they are known, their faith has been heard all over. They are known for their faith and uh, their love towards uh, saints is spoken everywhere. So, uh, church at Ephesus are known for their faith and love. The word here, faith here, should not be uh, misunderstood or limited to uh, our acceptance of some kind of uh, uh, truths about God, uh, but it should be seen as an active trust uh, in who God is and participating in what He is doing as as our response to what He has already done. So faith is not just asserting and accepting and uh, believe just saying uh, approving or uh, uh, you know going along with uh, the truths that are being explained to us uh, historically or theologically or in whatever the you know whatever scientific uh, methods we use so faith should not be understood just a psychological or intellectual or educational property but the faith is uh, of course, uh, we accept the truths about God and the scripture, but it has to be seen more like an active trust in who God is and knowing what he has done for us and responding to what he has done for us by participating, what he is already doing in us and in the church and in the world. So that's what faith is all about. The, even G, James says, uh, faith without deeds is dead. This is what it means. So faith cannot be limited to education or intellectual as an intellectual property. But it has to be uh, living practice 
for all of us as participation uh, in what God is already doing in this world. And here another word we can find is love. Love for all the, uh, all the saints. One important thing we need to understand is this faith and love cannot be separated. They are inseparable. They are always together. If someone has faith, he cannot help himself but having love towards his brother. Faith leads to actions of love and this love is seen through unity. So if somebody has faith, it will be resulted, it will be seen through the actions of love. That same thing Apostle John also says. If anyone says that they know God but do not love their neighbor, he love their brother, he's a liar. So the only way where our faith can be seen is through our actions of love. So this faith and love cannot be separated. They are, uh, they are always together. And uh, the rest of the prayer uh, uh, in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 15 to 23 are actually summarized within these two words. The entire prayer, prayer can be summarized in these two words. What, faith, what is faith and what is the uh, result of having faith that is actions of love. And this love can be seen through unity. And not only just this prayer, the rest of the epistle also. If you look entire book of episode, uh, Ephesians, we find what the Apostle Paul is trying to communicate to us is by giving us the truth of uh, truth through uh, about our faith, and he explains who God is and who we are, and what Christ has done and accomplished for us, and what He is doing in our lives, and through which He explains how our life should be. So, if you summarize the entire book of Ephesians, it can be it can be said as the faith and the love of the church. These words they they can explain everything that uh, book of Ephesians is talking about. If you look at verse seventeen to twenty three, uh, uh, you know I'm segregating the prayer into uh, various sections. Uh, especially verses 17 to 23, we can divide into two sections. In the first section, Apostle Paul prays that we may know the God of glory. That's what written in verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. He prays that we may know the God of glory. And important thing here to notice is it is completely it is completely by the revelation of God, not by our education. We cannot know God by our education or our theology. Our theology would help us to experience God more intimately. But knowing God, it completely works through our uh, walk in faith or through our uh, relationship in which we are known. We know that we are loved. In that trust, the relationship which is completely based on trust, a relational trust, that's where we will be knowing God. And which can happen only by the work of the Holy Spirit. Unless the Holy Spirit reveals to us, we will not be able to know the Father. That's what Jesus even said. No one knows the Father except the Son. No one knows the Son except the Father. Uh, except the Father. Uh, and whom he wants to reveal, they only can come to know. And no one can come to the Father unless the Holy Spirit leads them towards the Father. It is the complete work of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit to know. If you want to know God, we have to, uh, you know, we have to completely depend on God. And we need to have the Spirit of God, uh, the Spirit of God and the wisdom of God and the revelation of God. In fact, it is a Trinitarian work. So if we are growing in the knowledge of God, that means it is a Trinitarian work. In other words, we are working along with, or participating along with the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. Only then we will be growing in the knowledge of God. This is a Trinitarian revelation. God wants us to know, sir, he wants us to know God in the Trinitarian relationships. That's what Apostle Paul says. The... <coughs> The goal of the church, the calling of the church is to know God in these Trinitarian 
relationships. So as the Spirit of God is leading, we will be knowing and learning about the Father in the face of Jesus Christ. As the Father is being revealed through Jesus Christ, we will be provided <laughs> illumination by the Holy Spirit. So when, when only when all these three persons of the Trinity work in our lives, then only we will be growing in the knowledge of God. So Paul prays that we may know the God of this glory and which is possible only by the Trinitarian work of God. And as we participate with the as we participate with God in Trinitarian relationships, we will be growing in the knowledge. And second part, he speaks, uh, he prays that we may know the glory of God. First part speaks about uh, praise that we may know God of the glory. And second part speaks that we may, uh, sorry, second, uh, second part explains that how, uh, explains that we may know the glory of God. So this glory of God can be also separated into, uh, we can do some segregation. First part, it is focuses on the saints means believers okay and uh, that is especially from verse uh, 17 uh, 18 and uh, even till 20 so verse 17 from verse 17 we we understand that apostle paul prays that we may know the person of god which we have already seen that he wants us to know who god is the god, god of this glory and second part, second thing is, he prayed that we may know the program of God. First, he wants us to know the person of God. Second, he wants us to know the program of God. We can well find, uh, we can also call the purpose of God, we can call. So just uh, to put in order, I just uh, I took the word program. So verse 18, if you read, we understand. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Apostle Paul prays that we may know the purpose of God. He called us with a calling and uh, we, he, he wants that we may know what is the hope of our calling. We may know what is ahead of us. He may, we may know that where we are heading. In other words, the vision which we talked just a few minutes ago, so Apostle Paul wants us to know that. Uh, that's what he prayed in verse 18. Here two things we can see very clear, very much, uh, very clearly. And uh, uh, th those are number one is the hope of our calling. And number two is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in saints. So Paul wants us that, that we may know these two things. Number one, we may know the purpose, hope of our calling. And number two is what are the riches of his glory in uh, 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 riches of uh, his glory, sorry, riches of his glory of his inheritance in saints. What is the hope of our calling? A lot of people say the hope of a Christian calling is going to heaven or being healed, or becoming rich, and so many other stuff we hear. But from Apostle Paul and uh, uh, entire scripture, we understand the hope of our calling is the union with God. We can find it in John chapter 17, where Jesus also was explaining, even of course, Apostle Paul also uh, said the same things in the rest of the epistle, uh, which we will be discussing later. Uh, but uh, for this point, I would like to bring uh, from the prayer of uh, Jesus, what Jesus was looking, according to Jesus, what is our goal as a Christian? He is explained in John chapter 17, verse 20 to 23. Here he is praying to the Father. It is called the high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ. Okay, he, here he says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, uh, sorry, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me. And 
have loved them as we have loved me. John chapter 17, verse 22. 23 here it is it clearly ex explains apostle Paul, uh, sorry here jesus clearly explains the goal he is looking for the christians or disciples or believers is that we may be in him and he may be in us if father as father is in him he is in the father we in other words we may participate in the trinitarian life we may become one with god we may become one with jesus we may enter into the unity or in the, we may enter in the union, we may live in the union with God, which Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are experiencing, and we may participate with them. That is the goal as God, as Jesus is looking forward for all the Christians, all the believers. And that is clearly explained in his prayer. So the hope of our calling is very clear, that is living in union with God. So what about then, what about the riches of his glory? This is also similar to that only. Okay, we read in Ephesians uh, clearly that all things are in Jesus. Okay, and what are the riches of his glory then? The riches of uh, his glory and in fact, uh, it's clearly written, our, the riches of his glory, uh, the, the inheritance in the saints. There is an inheritance in the saints. What is that inheritance is clearly explained in Colossians chapter 1 verse 27. In fact, even Ephesians in Ephesians also will come across just for the change. I took words from here. Uh, Colossians 1 27, it says, To them God will to, God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Again, it is the same thing. Christ is living in us. That is the inheritance that we got. When Christ is living, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, three persons, one God, the entire God is living in us, which Apostle Paul explains at the end of his prayer. Okay, so entire God is living in us. That is a great inheritance God has set for us. And it is so silly for us to think the inheritance he set for us is some kind of uh, uh, villas or some kind of apartments in uh, heaven or some kind of golden roads or some great buildings or pearls or some kind of heavenly currency we are going to gain like, like uh, some religious faiths teach. So it is not like that. The greatest inheritance God has given to us is himself. Greatest inheritance a son gets from his father is the father himself. Similarly, the great inheritance we got is Christ is living in us, who is the hope of our glory. And uh, uh, in verse 19, Apostle Paul, he prays that we may know the power of God. First, he prayed that we may know the person of God. Number two, he prayed that we may know the program or the purpose of God. And number three, we may know the power of God. In verse 19, he says, And what is exceeding uh, greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the work of his mighty power. Apostle Paul wants, uh, wants us that we should experience the riches of Christ, uh, the power of God. He called us for a dynamic life. You know, we are called to live by the power of God. Christians, we are not uh, called to be some kind of, a, uh, you know, uh, what we call like a dope. People can take us. We are, we are called to live by the dynamic power of God. This does not mean that we have to get back to, uh, we, we need to establish some kind of political kingdom here. We need to start political parties. or No, this is nothing about that. But we, he called us to live by the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, he did not call us to be some uh, passive people who, who cannot make Shame, who cannot influence the world, but he called us to influence the world. He wanted to reveal himself through the world. He chose us to be the representatives of his kingdom. And uh, how are we going to influence this world? By nothing but living, uh, participating with God, with God, uh, with what God is already doing in this world. 
It is the work of God to establish his kingdom. But we are called to participate with him as we are participating with God. As we are participating with the triune life of God, we will be influencing the people around us. We will be influencing the world around us. We are not called to create a kind of influence for ourselves, but we are called to uh, be the representatives of the influence of God on this world. We are, call, we are called to live by the power of resurrection, but not by our own power. It's completely by his power, by his, uh, and we are going to live by faith. And the next part of this prayer, it focuses on the sun in verses 20 and 21, uh, where we can see that uh, the power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this is but also in the in that which is to come. This power that raised Jesus from the dead, this is the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Apostle Paul warns that we should experience the power of resurrection. Uh, we may think, what is this power of resurrection? That is, does it mean we have to? turn the world upside down? Does it mean the political power? Does it mean uh, uh, any power that uh, helps us to perform only miracles? No. The same thing we can find in Book of Acts. In Book of Acts, we can see the disciples turn the world upside down. They turn the world upside down not by any political or army power. They turn the world upside down not by completely miracles only. They turn the world upside down by a great weapon they got that is the message of the gospel, the message of the love of God, the message of the resurrection of Jesus, which is the forgiveness of this world. So that is the power he had given to us. The gospel is the power that God had given to us, according to Apostle Paul from Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it brings salvation to the world. It is the power of God bring it that brings the salvation to the world, Apostle Paul says. So we are called to experience the power of God. And we can do that when we talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, then we'll be able to experience that power. And when we continuously talk about it, we will be able to live according to the resurrection power of Jesus Christ and be able to influence the world around us. So church, brothers and sisters, and we have to talk about Jesus. We have to talk about the gospel. Otherwise, we won't be able to experience that power and we will become just like doormats. So, Apostle Paul prays that we may experience the power of the resurrection. And uh, uh, and at the same, uh, he challenges us to experience the power of resurrection and he also comforts us and encourages us and uh, tell, uh, by saying that Jesus, he is exercising the power being seated at the right hand of God. As Jesus said, go therefore make disciples of all the nations. Uh, uh, be before saying that he said this word, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. That's why you go therefore. So God is not sending us. Jesus is not simply sending us by our, to do things by ourselves. But he is confirming us that uh, uh, he is... Uh, having authority and power in heaven and on earth on that with that confidence we can move forward the same thing apostle paul here again he is explaining uh power he exercises jesus exercises power being seated at the right hand of god and he challenges us to experience and exercise the same power and dominion dominion and jesus has this power and dominion not just in this world but also in the days to come and the same power is available to us in Jesus Christ as we are taking the gospel of Jesus we will be able to experience the authority of Jesus with the government officials who come to us they exercise the authority and power just because they bring the message of the government the representatives of the king uh, king they exercise the power because they bring the message of the king Similarly, when we take the message of our king, we will be able to exercise the power of the king. And the third part of this prayer, it focuses on the church. First part focuses on the saints. Second part, it, uh, saints individually. And second part, it focuses on Christ. And third part, it focuses on the church, verses 22 and 
23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him. He put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Here comes what I said previously. God is filling all things, uh, all in all. Uh, you know, we are in him and uh, he in us. Of course, we'll look into it. Uh, Jesus is the head over all things to the church. And Christ is the body of Christ. Oh, sorry, church is the body of Christ. This is a great teaching from Apostle Paul. And the church bears the fullness of Christ. Have you ever thought about it? We read the Colossian word, the Colossian where it says, The fullness of Godhead bodily dwelleth in the Lord. And we are complete in Him. Why are we complete in Him? Because the fullness of God is dwelling in Jesus and He is dwelling in us. And church bears the fullness of Christ. That's why we are called the body of Christ. And through the church, Jesus is all in all. We, uh, we uh, Christ, God is all in all and all we study. And it is not like uh, the pantheist or panentheistic understanding where uh, the presence of God is in uh, everything, every rock, every tree and uh, uh, everything that is in the creation and every all creation is in God. Uh, not in this sense. So through church, God is all in all. He is in us and we are in him. The same thing Apostle Paul explained in verse 10. All things are gathered in Jesus. That is verse 10. And in verse 23, he says, uh, and he is who he fills, uh, he fills all in all, in us, in the church. He, he, with the fullness of himself, he is filling us so that we in him and he in us. This is the vision Jesus was talking uh, in the prayer. We may know that he is in us, he is in us, uh, he, uh, we in him and he is in us. That uh, uh, interpenetration of lives, participation into the, the life of the Trinity, the perichoresis life. This is what Apostle Paul is praying for. So, Apostle Paul prays that uh, uh, we may uh, know the uh, God of this glory in person, in relationship. And uh, that is what talking about our faith. And he prays that we may know glory of God, in which he prays that we may know the person of God, we may know the program or purpose of God, and we may know uh, the power of God and uh, uh, he wants us to experience that uh, resurrection power of God. And uh, he also pray, he prays that uh, God has chosen the church to fill the church with all with his fullness, with the fullness of Christ, so that the church may be in Christ, Christ may be in the church. That is the vision that God has for the church. And it is going to be seen as a walk in love which Apostle Paul praised the Ephesian church for. He praised their faith and love, which are completely interconnected. And when we grow in faith, we will grow in the actions of love towards brethren and the world around us. So that is what this prayer is all about. With that, I would like to stop. If you have any questions or any comments or anything to add, feel free to do that. Uh, Surya Murthy always had the record of kicking off the discussion. Looks like I'm going to beat him today. <laughs> just joking, Surya Murthy. Um, just uh, two two comments, uh, Praveen. And one is uh, that point which you mentioned about uh, faith and love goes together. Uh, I think is uh, uh, a really an excellent point because. Uh, you know, we've always wondered faith without works is dead. And I think if we can understand that faith manifests itself in love is what 
the Bible teaches. And I think that point that you brought up is excellent. And I was just thinking, uh, if you take our, uh, you know, our, uh, uh, what we are focusing on, on in GCI, faith, hope, love. So the church should have, you know, faith, uh, you know, and the hope and the love, all of it goes together and makes us a healthy church. I thought I'd just mention that, but uh, excellent point. Uh, another, maybe another uh, issue, I think you briefly mentioned it. Um, you talk, we are talking about Jesus in us, we in Jesus, right? And uh, it will be probably be helpful to make that distinction with what some faiths and even New Age Christianity is talking about, where they say, uh, oh, you know, God is in, in all. All we have to do is look within us. We have to find God inside of us. And, and even New Age Christianity is beginning to tend to move towards that, that nothing is, you know, faulty or wrong. Uh, and I think you mentioned about pantheism, panentheism. Um, maybe it'll be nice to just say a little bit more about that. How do we distinguish between when uh, people say that you should look within us, you will find God because Jesus is in you and uh, you go, have to go within yourself to find God. Can you make some, a little bit more, uh, you know, clarification on that? Yes, there is a distinction between um, panentheism and when we Christianity talks about Christ in us and the, uh, we are in Christ and so that Christ may be all in all. Um, the panentheistic thought is uh, uh, when pa the panentheistic thought about God in creation, creation in God is considered in two uh, two aspects. Number one is it is uh, considered in the perspective of uh, existentialism or in terms of uh, me metaphysics, which we call talking about the existence of us. Uh, how are we existing? You know, God is existing in the creation. Creation is existing in God. You cannot separate and they are one. So, in terms of metaphysics, they consider uh, this all-in-all -all concept, number one. And number two is geographical concept. God is present in every rock, tree, and these uh, geographically, he is literally present in that. But when it comes to Christianity, when we talk about God is in all and God filling, God filling us with this fullness, it is not uh, uh, existential. It is not even geographical. It is completely relational aspect. Father is in the son, son is in the father, not just because they don't have any place to stay. And uh, they are in each other. That is like, you know, they are in relationship with each other. Just like, uh, you know, uh, I'm just taking this phrase like, you know, I'm into you. That's what we say, like, you know, to say that I love you. Like in such a way, in such a sense, in relationship, we are in each other. So Christ is in us, we are in him in relationship. That's where it makes difference again. People say, okay, Jesus is in everyone. So Jesus is in him, non-Christian also. What is the difference it makes between Christian and non-Christian? Jesus uh, is in non-Christian. Uh, so Jesus is uh, in Christian in relational aspect. Whoever re responded to Jesus, whoever responded to the gospel, whoever walks in relationship with the father, and with them, he is already in them and they are in him. It is not with ev everyone and anyone like panentheistic thoughts say. And there are already groups that are growing there. They call themselves as Christian panentheists. Okay, so this New Age movement is making a very big influence on Christianity as well. And that is where the doctrine of Trinity helps us very much. And next thing is in panentheism, uh, they, as I said, the God in creation, creation in God for uh, uh, the very purpose of existence, right? Uh, and uh, Christianity also talks about uh, existence, which we call metaphysics. Uh, our existence is in our relationships. It is not in any other kind of, uh, uh, you know, geographical kind of connection or just not just the source of somebody or the energy that has been provided to us according to panentheism god provides the energy for the creation to exist and uh, creation is uh, the channel where god 
God can exercise and reveal his, uh, his power. But in Christianity, it is completely different. We call it um, uh, the word uh, onto relationships, they call enveloped in each other. Okay, so the very existence of Father, Son and the Holy Spirit is in the reality of they are in each other. They are in relationship with each other. Our existence also is not based completely on the, on the fact that God has taken mud and made us. The, our existence is based on the reality that God loves us. He is in us. So not in the mud. His presence is not in the mud. His presence is the relationship he has with us, which symbolically he breathed, uh, he breathed into us the breath of life. That that can reveal uh, that that can be a symbol we can look into. So that's why in um, Book of Luke, uh, when Luke gives the genealogy of Jesus Christ, he goes from uh, he goes back and he goes till Adam and he gives the description Adam the son of God. In other words, again the existence of Adam is in the very relationship that Adam has with the Father. So that's how it works. Does it make any sense? Uh, yes, I think uh, that word relational is so important, uh, which basically helps us to understand that uh, though Jesus is in us, we are in him, there is still a distinction, just as Father, Son, Holy Spirit are one, and yet there is a distinction between the persons. In other words, we don't, uh, uh, we don't, uh, we don't just melt away, we don't merge, we don't cease to exist. We have our individual identity. Our union with Christ retains our individuality. So that is not compromised. Uh, so we are not an illusion. Uh, we are, you know, God loves real people and we are real. And so, and I think uh, that helps us to appreciate more the uh, tremendous, that inheritance that you talked about. Uh, that that um, to be in Christ and to enjoy that sense of relational harmony and joy and oneness and 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 love. So maybe yeah, that that's a very good point. Yes, Bertie. Am I right in saying that God, we are God's children through regeneration, through rebirth. We are God's. Uh, uh, yeah, we have been made by God. Uh, uh, like uh, by we are children uh, through his creation, uh, through uh, uh, first parents, Adam and Eve, we all come down uh, and share in the flesh and blood and, you know, uh, the makeup. But uh, as we know, uh, God, God always, his plan was, and he wants us to be his children as uh, Pastor Praveen, you're mentioning that we are called to have that, uh, you know, the close communion, the oneness, uh, which begins by, you know, uh, turning to him. is by the grace of God and through faith in Christ to turn to him and get baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, we become his children by regeneration. We are in Christ. Christ is in us. And through Christ, uh, through his son, we have fellowship with the Father in the Holy Spirit. Uh, in, that, in that sense, we partake of his divine nature uh, because so intimately we're brought into him and uh, we also partic uh, we partake of his uh, divine life and nature and we also participate in his mission and ministry in the world. Uh, so uh, am I right in saying that we are children, that intimate connection that we have and we'll always be, that's why he says he in us, we in him and he is all in all. The body of Christ is all in all, you know, Christ, the triune God dwelling in us. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, we are his children through regeneration. Yes, uh, Pastor Praveen? Um, yeah, I would like to answer a little differently, but I appreciate what you have shared and uh, most of it is... Uh, it's a, it fits very well with our uh, scripture. Uh, I just put like, I would like to put things here and there. Uh, so, uh, according to Ephesians and the entire Christian uh, teaching, and in fact, uh, the Trinitarian theology, first we are redeemed. In other words, we are, uh, we are made the children of God first, and then we are created. Okay. The lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. And uh, we are created, uh, we are called, God has chosen us to be his children before the foundation of the world. 
to be holy and blameless in his sight. And then he created us. And what you talked about regeneration and the work of the Holy Spirit, this helps us to live worthy of our calling. In other words, to live like the children of God. The regeneration is not making us the children of God. The regeneration experience, it is helping us to live as the children of God. We are made the children of God by the work of God before the foundation of the world in Christ Jesus. And it has been accomplished. And it has been revealed to us uh, through Jesus Christ. And by the experience of this uh, regeneration, by the work of the Holy Spirit, we are being helped so that from that point we may be able to live who as who we are. So that's that's a little uh, difference, but basically uh, you are quite, uh, I mean, I, I believe you're quite uh, uh, clear and uh, you align with quite well with the scripture. Yes, it's uh, uh, as the scriptures say that uh, he foreknew us. Uh, those he foreknew, he uh, predestinated them to be uh, 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 to conform to the image of his firstborn son, Jesus Christ. Those he predestinated, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he sanctified and uh, glorified. Uh, uh, but do, uh, but does not this calling that comes, uh, you know, that's for sure. That's by his grace through faith in Christ. Call is not the calling. Uh, calling is to turn to me. And uh, even in, some, in Isaiah, it says, only confess that you have sinned against me. You know, turn to even that grace of giving, you know, to turn to him and to... Uh, uh, yeah, we are predestinated. We are by His grace, by His love and mercy alone. We are brought into this relationship. But uh, wouldn't you call these signs that you know when we turn to Him, we get baptized uh, in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? We walk as you write. This, the Holy Spirit is there with us, Christ in us, uh, doing sanctifying work and and you know doing His work through us. And we have the blessings, as mentioned, the Ephesians and all. My point is, don't we look at that as, as uh, you know, uh, sign, signs, you know, like uh, when we turn to him, turn means returning to him, uh, repentance, baptism, and receiving the spirit, living in faith, all that. Um, absolutely. But yeah, I agree with uh, most of the things that you have said. I'll just yeah. put in a little difference, not much, very slight difference that is there, uh, that is... Uh, uh, whatever we uh, you said uh, by in the by foreknowledge of God by the work of God we have been made the children of God we I accept that we also have responsibility to respond in repentance and faith. I mean yeah. that's the point you were trying to pick it up. So the repentance is not for God. Repentance is for us. Yes, we require repentance. God doesn't require our repentance. Yeah, we require so that we may be able to connect to God. We yeah. may be able to relate to God. It is yeah. not that God does not know anything, so we have to confess and repent so that he, that moment he would come to know and to help us to go through the process. It is not like that. Repentance and faith, those are things we require, not God. Those are not requirements for God. So, God, uh, but this repentance, this baptism, all these things, they help us. Yeah. You know? They yeah. help us to live as who we are. Yes. It's... Help us to live worthy of our calling. Yeah. If there's no repentance, we would not have a vision about who we are. Yeah, if correct. we don't have the faith, we won't be able to move forward. That's where yeah. the Holy Spirit comes and uh, steps in and leads us into the fullness of life. So yeah. God has accomplished our life before the creation of the world. And he yeah. introduced it as through our creation and revealed it to us through Jesus Christ. And through hope, by work of the Holy Spirit, we, are, we will be able to live worthy of it. So... Yeah. We participate with the Holy Spirit and the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit through, through our repentance, baptism, and faith. All yeah. these things help us to participate with God. Yeah. As so a scripture, says, when we believe Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is given to us. Yes. Uh, so that is, uh, my point is that, uh, you know, we have to be uh, very aware of that thing. And uh, to know that we're distinctly, like, you know, called and uh, God has blessed us with his blessing. And our citizenship is in heaven uh, from whence we await the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to come. But his working in us now, you know, to uh, leading to the our glorification. And we should be aware of us so that uh, in times of our lows and highs, you know, we should know that he is there. 
um, uh, I'm just telling you about my own condition. Uh, you know, of late, uh, you know, I'm, I'm missing out in prayers. There's some some hindrance is there, which is like uh, like either like I feel dull. I feel, uh, you know, I feel uh, what call uh, I feel uh, this thing. Uh, I, uh, you know, I feel little, uh, like uh, sleepy or feel dull. I feel some uh, un a discomfort in my head, and uh, th and uh, that is sort of like a hindrance to me to praying and to you know to meditate, which is so important to us. God says, you know, uh, the psalmist says, "I've hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against you." God's word in us is very important, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, uh, and uh, what do you call that? Your uh, meditating on the word and knowing Him, because it it it's needed in our low and high times, you know, to uh, to give us stability yeah. and help. I have been affected of late, so I just uh, and you know, my point is that we should be aware. Of Christ in us. If God says, if you're not aware Christ in us, you uh, then you are a reprobate. You know. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, that I can relate to what you're trying to say, Bertie. Yes, we should be aware of uh, Christ in us, and yeah. uh, in times of low, we we will definitely have times of high and low. That's where uh, we are. We are in a, we are in church. We help each other as brothers and sister, sisters. Yeah. So I I appreciate uh, Bertie. Yeah. What you say. Yes, Anil, sir. Uh, you know, we mentioned that uh, children of God, all of us are children of God. But all the, all the people of the world are children of God in the sense that God created them, right? But, uh, I mean, when we as believers, when we are born again, which is that, that we put our faith in Christ, and, you know, we start believing in Christ, and then our life is converted, which is being born again. And don't you think that is where our sonship or our daughtership is cemented, you know, with God? So so when we are saying children of God, everybody is a children of God, but we are specially children of God because we have been born again and we have put our faith in Christ. Uh, definitely. Is that okay? No, definitely. It, 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 uh, that is uh, scriptural also. All are made children of God. Apostle Paul uses interesting words. Uh, in book of Ephesians only, we'll be discussing it later. He calls uh, non-believers as children of disobedience. Mm -hmm. but still children, that disobedient children. We are the obedient children. So our born again experience, our spiritual experience, and even John chapter 1 verse 12, it says, whoever believe it, believed in him, he had given the right to become the children of God. That clarifies right. more. So you use the word cemented. Uh, that's that's a, it's a good way of expression. Perhaps we can say is uh, for God we are always His children, but for us we don't know that we are God is our Father. Mm -hmm. So this experience will be a starting point for us. This experience will be a point where we appropriate the right to be the children of God. Mm -hmm. It's not that God had given; God had made, and God had given. This is objective and subjective part of it. So, subjectively, from that point, we will be able to uh, relate to God. We recognize God as our Father, and we live. We start living uh, worthy of our calling. We can say we start living like the children of God. Previously, though we are the children of God, we were not living like the children of God. We are living like the children of disobedience. Now we yes. we turned, we repented, we changed our mind. We God did not change His mind. We changed our mind. Our mind is changed. So from that point, we are living like the children of God. So the relationship, it is, uh, it is, it is on, uh, as we say, you no, know, the rubber hit the road like that. From that point onwards, the relation we start experiencing the relationship in two ways. Previously, uh, that is not changing any reality. Everything is the same. It is changing our experience. That's all. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, Franklin, Uncle. Uncle, you are on mute. Hello? Yes, you are audible. Uh, Praveen, excellent point, seconded by our senior pastor. Uh, faith, hope, and love are interdependent. You cannot have one ex ex exclusively. So they are inexplicably uh, interconnected, number one. A second point, no, sir. 
I mean, you made some very nice observation. Uh, you said uh, uh, God is not going to give us apartments in heaven. Uh, sir, can you please explain? Uh, there is one particular verse in the Bible which says, uh, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go there to prepare a place for you. Uh, absolutely. Um, that's an interesting uh, scripture you have reminded us. Uh, you need We need to notice when Jesus spoke that word. Jesus did not speak that word before his ascension. He said that word before his crucifixion. John chapter 14, am I right? Uh, in John chapter 14, he tells in my father's house, there are many mansions. So where was it? Where was Jesus going? Was he going to heaven and the, what the picture we take, we get about? No, it is not. Okay. So when Jesus said there are mansion in the house or there is place in the house, he's, he what he meant to say is there is a place in the father's heart. That's what he meant to explain. Okay, he is not building, he is not the architect going to heaven and building apartments for us. And there again, we have the problem, who gets the biggest, up, a bigger apartment? Who gets the beautiful apartment? Okay, so all these things are not there. What Jesus meant to say was, because of my crucifixion, death, burial and resurrection, you all are going to have a great place in my father's heart. It, it's, it doesn't mean, again, he is creating it through his uh, uh, through his work. There is already, whatever father has, the same thing Jesus revealed. Okay, So, because of Jesus' death, burial and resurrection, we will be able to act, realize that God the Father has place for us in his heart. That's why he sent his son, because he has place for me in his heart. Through his work, we are realizing that God, ha God has a place for us in his heart. Through his work, we will be able to accept and uh, relate to him. So that's what Jesus meant when he said there is a place in uh, uh, my father's house. That's what, uh, It is not apartment. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yes, uh, Suryamurthy said, then uh, we can go with uh, Rekha ma'am. Go ahead. I have to say, okay. I just uh, was thinking that when, uh, when we become spiritual beings, we are ruling the universe. So it's possible that we would be used, uh, be the many mansions also could be in the physical universe as spirit beings too. We don't know really what the mansions could mean. Yeah, there are certain things we can speculate. I believe uh, uh, this speculation with uh, hope, <laughs> it, it's it's okay. <laughs> we, want, we want to live in mansions, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, this always helps. Some kind, though these are speculation, these imaginations help us to be rooted in our faith. Some kind of thing. <laughs> uh, I mean, establishment they help us. Yeah, I'm I'm open for the speculations. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Murthy, sir. Sir, you're on mute. Yes. You said the mansions refer to the place places uh, in God's heart. Why did you say so? Pardon? Why did, why did I say so? It is because... Uh, you asked me why did I say that. Am I right, Uncle? You said... The mentions refer to... The places in God's heart. The places in God's heart. Yes. What is yeah, the reason is uh, uh, the point where Jesus said this word, number one. It is not before ascension, but he said that before his crucifixion. If we take that word literally like a um, mansion only, Jesus also said another word. I am going and I will come back and take you. He went and he came back and he did not take us. That goes also wrong. So the place where Jesus said... It may it, it helps us to relate because the first half can be right, second half cannot be right. That is not a logical argument. Am I right? So both should be right. 
So if the first thing, first part we take literally, second part also we need to take literally. So Jesus said that before his crucifixion, because of his crucifixion, death, burial and resurrection, we are able to uh, re relate and we are able to connect to the place that God has in our in his heart for us. So that is the reason I have said what I said. And another thing is the book of Revelation ends with, uh, it doesn't end with God, Jesus taking us to heaven, but bringing, the, bringing down the heavenly Jerusalem down to earth. So this also doesn't match with that. He said he will take us to a ma mansion, but he is bringing down the mansion down to us, city down to us. I don't know if there are any mansions in that or not, but however, he is bringing the city down. So this also doesn't go uh, in a literal sense with the taking this word in a literal sense. In the earlier times, in the worldwide church of God, we used to believe the mansions refer to office. There are several positions, several positions. Okay. Yeah, it may be there. Uh, I guess Pastor Dan can help because he is into both. I'm completely into GCI, so I don't know about that properly. He can help us out. Yeah, I think the previous belief was that just as uh, the 12 disciples were promised, you know, that they will uh, have rulership. Uh, was it over the 12 tribes? I'm not sure. I, I can't remember. Uh, so uh, there was a lot of emphasis on physical rulership. And we used to say that we will all inherit a particular planet where we can then rule uh, those planets. And I think to some extent, uh, I don't know if uh, Suryamurthy uh, studied this, but uh, we had a little bit of Mormonism in our uh, teaching. Uh, so we used to very strongly emphasize on physical rulership. Uh, but once again, we have to decide what G if whether Jesus were, what Jesus was saying was a metaphor or was it literal. That is where we have to uh, make a distinction. Bertie has a point here. Yeah? Yes, uh, you're you're right, Mr. Zechariah. Our earlier teaching was uh, regarding uh, having mansions uh, prepared a place for you was uh, alluded to an office that we would. But Ms. Zakara, I don't quite remember uh, ruling over another planet. <laughs> uh, and yeah, the 12, the 12 disciples were promised, uh, you know, being a king or ruling the 12 tribes of Israel. That's right. That's there. That was, uh, you know, at Christ's second coming when he and us, as Praveen says, the heavenly Jerusalem, you know, will come down, and uh, the 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 kingdom of God will uh, rule earth wide, and right. uh, we will be there. Yeah, we will be there, and uh, yes, uh, look forward to it. <laughs> the logic we used was: Why would God create such a vast universe? And uh, hence, you know, uh, He must have some purpose creating all these stars. And apparently it was for us human beings who will go and rule, you know, uh, galaxies and stars and clusters of stars. So that is how we used to reason. <laughs> Perhaps uh, maybe I would like to consider this way. There are a lot of places uh, scripture is clear and so in a lot of places scripture is not very clear. Uh, so these are some things, some details where scripture is not very clear. And uh, I, I don't like to say you should not speculate at all. So to a certain extent, you can speculate as long as it doesn't go uh, away from uh, completely distracted, uh, di disoriented from uh, the main teaching of the scripture. So main, main vision of the scripture is very clear for our future. That is Apostle Paul, as he explained in, in this prayer, that God's vision for our lives is to live in union with Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the living in the union and communion and ex expressing the same life through our love towards others. This is the vision very clearly established in the scripture. Uh, on top of it, 
whatever little speculations we are able to uh, we feel, we feel to make i feel uh, it is okay there we, we we don't need to be uh, very uh, dogmatic and judgmental in those sense mm -hmm. The mother of the mother of Bonajis, if I remember correctly, the mother of the sons of thunder. Yes. She was asking for a better placement for her sons in the heaven. Yes. This all indicates some sort of office. Uh, yeah, I would like to respond to that in this way. The, immediately, Jesus said, you do not know what you're asking about. Uh, so we think if there is some kind of offices and uh, some kind of hierarchy and all, the first word Jesus tells us is, uh, you don't know what you're asking about. You don't know what you're talking about. But he, does not yeah. deny that. he does not deny that also. He says, it is not for me to decide that. It is God who, Father who will decide that. Uh, that's where uh, I would like to explain, Uncle, uh, because a lot of things, heavenly things, Jesus also said that if I speak about earthly things, you are not able to understand. If I speak about heavenly things, you won't be even able to understand. Uh, so uh, when we understand, even when children ask about certain questions which are beyond their capacity to relate, what we say is you do not know what you're asking about and then uh, this kind of uh, expression we usually use. And then Jesus says, whoever wants to be the greatest should be the servant. The servant. That's what uh, Jesus said. There itself, he turned her uh, expectation upside down. So, uh, so we do not know about those. Uh, however, uh, please, you can share some more information about it, uh, some more thoughts. We, can, we all can discuss about those. Uh, but we already passed seven minutes uh, from the scheduled time. And so perhaps uh, we'll close with prayer. Uncle, I'm open and uh, please share some of your thoughts in WhatsApp. I mean, in a pers personal text in WhatsApp uh, or email. We'll uh, uh, look into it and get back to those uh, thoughts, Uncle. Uh, you want to ask someone to close, uh, Pravin? Yeah, perhaps uh, can I ask Mr. Franklin to do that? Would you please close in? You're, you're, on, you're on mute, Uncle. Please unmute yourself. We you're... can't hear you, Franklin. Sir, now can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Gracious Lord, our loving Father, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity to meet on this forum. Thank you, Lord, despite being geographically dispersed in far-flung areas, Lord, you have given us the opportunity and a privilege to meet, come together, sit down and learn. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you, Lord, for all your mercies and compassion, Lord, sustaining us, teaching us and helping us to grow. Especially, Lord, we want to thank you for all our pastors who struggle and who try to explain to you. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you, Lord, for all of us, Lord, who come week after week to learn and to grow. Lord, thank you so much. Lord, in the ultimate analysis, only you need to unlock our hearts and our minds. Lord, I just pray that you will fill us with your love and be with us. Lord, help us, Father, to know you more deeply, to learn of your ways and to grow into a deeper and a stronger relationship with you day by day. Looking forward, Lord, to the fullness of time when Christ will come and take over the reins of the earth. We pray, Lord, that you will hasten that day, the coming of your son, Jesus Christ, to this earth. Thank you so much, Father. Lord, we ask your blessings upon all of us. And do be with all those, Lord, who want to learn and grow, but find it difficult to synchronize their time with our time. Bless them, Lord, and they will be able to listen to these tapes and learn and grow. Thank you so much, Father. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 God bless you all.